praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, and as we can continue our study this morning into in First Corinthians, it's we've had three sessions uh, so far uh, with Brother Neville and Brother Sudhakar, and but I thought it's going to be a, it's going to take us a, a while to go through because it's quite lengthy and we're going systematically through the book uh, or this letter. I just we thought- We can't see a... you, brother. Okay, brother. Sorry. Your video is off. Yes. Okay, so so First Corinthians, what, uh, I just thought a very quick uh, reminder once again uh, of what this letter was. It was a letter written by Paul to the church in Corinth uh, early in the first century, uh, through the mid first century. And we know the issues. Uh, we've heard that a few times from different, uh, at different times about how Chloe's people had come to Paul, who was at Ephesus uh, during his uh, third missionary journey. And th uh, they then told him about the issues in Corinth and that prompted Paul to write but uh, we also know that at the same time a letter came to Paul from the church at Corinth the church was reasonably young only about three years old and they had certain queries uh, remember that the church back then didn't have the privilege of having a new testament uh, to refer to for guidelines of how to live so they had questions and uh, so Paul in his letter uh, firstly spoke about the issues that he heard about the church and then he also responded to uh, some of the queries the people were raising yeah and this is the overall structure uh, very a broad over view of what the epistle is about there's an introduction which we've completed uh, we're currently early in the stage where paul responds to reports of the corinthians conduct which is uh, starts in the 10th verse of first chapter and goes all the way to uh, the end of the si uh, sixth chapter. After that, you notice Paul saying, now regarding the things you wrote. And so from chapter seven, the context and the letter structure changes where Paul starts answering some of their queries and clari uh, clarifying some of their concerns. And then it concludes in chapter 16. The biggest thing that Paul deals with the first one that he deals with is something that we've been introduced to by Brother Neville in his last week's sermon, which is about divisions in the church. Uh, but brothers and sisters, uh, unlike many of the other portions of scripture where it's hard, seems lost in the mists of time, and Corinthians can feel intimate, can feel immediate, can feel very real. And uh, when we were doing this as part of a Bible study, uh, I came across a few videos, and I want to share one, which we, uh, if you, uh, those who attended the Bible study would have seen, but I just thought it, it, it's, it just makes it more real, the church at Corinth. It's not just some uh, place written uh, in the Bible that we can never really uh, sort of get any sense about. So I'll just share that. It's a short uh, six-minute video, and uh, uh, we'll just, uh, after that, we'll continue. Uh, it just gives you an overview of the place Corinth. It gives a little context about Paul's visit there as well. Business and order in Roman Corinth. When Paul came to Corinth, he found a city that was enjoying remarkable economic growth. It was a city of opportunity for the merchant, craftsperson, and something rare indeed in the ancient world the social climber. Corinth is located on a narrow isthmus between the Aegean and Adriatic seas. It is well placed to profit from trade between the eastern and western Mediterranean. Ships unloaded on the east side of the isthmus where their goods were transported over land and then reloaded on the west side. The Emperor Nero attempted to cut a canal across the isthmus in AD 67 to facilitate sea trade, but the project proved too difficult and was abandoned until modern engineering made it possible in the 19th century. Corinth's city center was surrounded by rows of shops, porches, and roofed entrances. These alcoves are all that remain of the series of shops in the downtown area's northwest sector. The Temple of Apollo, visible in the background, 
reminds visitors that the worship of the traditional Greco-Roman gods surrounded and supported the everyday life of the city. A long row of connected shops also ran along the south side of the city center. The grassy area would have once been the walkway of the long covered portico or columned porches, which ran in front of the entire length of shops. Shops also sat on the west end of the city, just below the temple of Hera, the wife of Zeus. Another market area arose to the north of the city, again with rows of shops and open spaces for the sale of wares and foods. Paul likely worked as a tent maker in one of these spaces or another such space yet to be discovered, finding a place at the better established workshop of Priscilla and Aquila, his fellow Christians and evangelists. When the Emperor Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome in 49 CE, Priscilla and Aquila relocated to the promising city of Corinth and set up shop shortly before Paul's arrival there, described in Acts 18 verses 1 to 3. Corinth had its central meat market, called a Macellum, in the northeast quarter of the downtown area. Originally a shrine to Apollo, this structure was converted to a more practical function by the time Paul visited Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 25, when he told his converts to eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, he was likely referring to this well-known space. As Corinth grew, private citizens took on more public works and gained public recognition. When one citizen named Erastus was elected to the office of Edile, the office entrusted with overseeing public buildings and festivals, he showed his appreciation by paving an area north of the theater complex. An inscription still visible today provides perpetual recognition for his gift. This may have been the same Erastus mentioned in Romans chapter 16, verse 23, who served as the city's treasurer and who had become part of the Christian congregation in Corinth. The Babius monument shows the self-promoting and self-congratulatory spirit of Roman Corinth. Gnaeus Babius Philanus was a freed man, a former slave, who rose to the offices of Edile, local priest, and Duol Vir, one of the city's two chief magistrates. He authorized the construction of this monument to himself as a testimony to his name, success, and benefactions to the city. The monument originally consisted of eight columns arranged in a circle, each bearing an ornate Corinthian capital adornment like this one, altogether supporting a cone-shaped roof. The same spirit of boasting, claiming honor, and calling for recognition would invade the Christian congregations in Corinth. Paul's ministry in Corinth aroused significant opposition from the Jewish community there which no doubt saw Paul as a competitor for the support of Gentiles sympathetic to the Jewish religion. Acts chapter 18 verses 7 to 8 records that Paul even drew away the leader of the synagogue and started meeting at the house of Titius Justus, a rich Gentile God-fearer. Evidence of a Jewish community in Corinth includes this partial inscription, which translates to gathering place of the Hebrews. This capital, decorated with menorahs and palm branches, once adorned the top of a pillar, probably from the synagogue in Corinth. Opposition to Paul and his new church-building efforts came to a head with the arrival of a new proconsul, Lucius Junius Gallio, governor of Achaia in 51 to 53 AD. The buildings in the foreground are the remains of the North Basilica, the headquarters of the proconsular governor of Achaia and the place where he would have conducted most of his business. According to Acts chapter 18, verse 12, however, members of the Jewish community brought their accusations against Paul to Gallio at the tribunal, or Bema. Members of Corinth's Jewish community charged Paul with introducing unlawful religious customs, something that would typically fall under the jurisdiction of the secular authority. Upon further examination, Gallio ruled that this was all just an internal Jewish affair in which he would not intervene. Only the foundation of the structure remains. The governor would have heard cases seated in an ornate structure atop this platform. This is another view of the bima from the southwest, showing the ascent to the top of the platform. The suit against Paul was unsuccessful, and he was able to spend a considerable time further in that city nurturing the congregation that would prove to be his most difficult over time. 
there is a well-known graffito that's just a singular for graffiti uh, in Rome, which depicts a worshiper standing before a crucified figure with the body of a man and the head of an ass with the inscription, uh, Alexo Menos worships his God. This is uh, known as the Alexo Menos graffito and is uh, sadly, uh, historically, one of the historical evidence of used of Christ's life that there was a person called Jesus Christ and that he was crucified because this is from the first century AD. But this graffito, which uh, I've just copied an image I could find to show you what it showed, uh, tells you the way the world, the worldly wise regarded the message of the cross. For them, it was a mockery. For them, it was a scandal. For them, it made no sense. Uh, it's interesting. So far in the morning, even uh, in uh, the time of worship, Brother Joel spoke and ended his uh, study on uh, Psalm 107, talking about uh, wisdom. And we just saw, sang, uh, Brother Sudhakar aptly chose a song about the wisdom of God. Uh, but what we are going to, what we looked at, the, and what we're going to continue looking at, verses 18 to 25 of the first chapter of uh, the letter to Corinthians, is a very important, very powerful statement, an argument from Paul. In this, we see a contrast uh, where Paul shows, uh, uh, casts between the foolishness of man, which man thinks is wisdom, and the versus the wisdom of God, which man thinks is foolish. So uh, it's a contrast between man, and also it's a contrast between man supposing understanding of power uh, and between God's revelation of power, which man thinks is a sign of weakness. So the two key issues here, brothers and sisters, in uh, verses uh, 18 to 25, uh, they are wisdom and power or the co contrasting nature of man's understanding of wisdom of power versus God's revelation, which man thinks or man inherently believes is a display of foolishness and weakness, not uh, wisdom and power. Because the, the gospel is an antithesis uh, of human wisdom and power. And here Paul, in this portion, Paul is arguing uh, let me just go to the. It, uh, Paul is arguing in this section that uh, what has always been the divine intent and thus has been foretold by the prophets, uh, and God has now accomplished through the crucifixion. And what was that? The creator and sustainer of this universe has brought an end to human self sufficiency through human wisdom and devices. So, and the way he has done, no human in their right mind or otherwise would have ever dreamed up of God's scheme of redemption, would have thought uh, or come up with such an almost crazy looking idea where all humanity is saved by a crucified Messiah. It's too preposterous. It's, it's uh, humiliating. A thing for a de to assume that a deity would be involved in something like this. Now, uh, we've read this. Uh, I'm going to read this again one more time. Please follow with me. Uh, we'll just go through this. Uh, and after that, we'll uh, go through this verse by verse. So uh, I'm going to read from verses 18 to 25 once again. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in, wis in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. 
For the Jews see, uh, demand signs and the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Uh, we'll just briefly look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your presence amongst us once uh, again this morning. Thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to reflect on your loving kindness, to worship you, Father. Now, Lord, as we look into your living word, Lord, we ask that your spirit would open our hearts and minds so we can comprehend uh, the great truth about the gospel, the great truth about the word of the cross, uh, so we can appreciate what our Savior has done, so we can appreciate your wisdom, Lord. Uh, so, uh, Lord, touch our hearts. Uh, in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, this whole section, this verses 18 to 25, uh, flows without any sort of a linear steps, uh, though we can see uh, that it starts off with a very clear opening uh, verse, which you could almost say it's an assertion, it's a kind of a thesis statement, uh, which lays out what he's going to talk about in detail. And it ends in verse 25 with a kind of a summary, which, uh, why, which he packages uh, all that he's spoken about. So the thesis statement, the opening, is this powerful verse, which says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Broadly, this section, brothers and sisters, is talking about, uh, it could be uh, broadly said that there are two kind of things being said. The first uh, truth, which sort of the first half of what we are studying would look at, is uh, it divides uh, humanity. The cross, the, the theme is the cross of Christ. And what the cross does, it divides humanity, as we'll see, and as you can see even in the opening verse. And the second thing it does, which uh, is the focus of this sort of latter half, is uh, how uh, the cross confronts human wisdom and overpowers human strength. And so we will go verse by verse and see how uh, it unpacks and how Paul uh, unpacked this powerful argument uh, when he was talking about, we know the theme is uh, started in verse 10, which is about divisions in the church. And this is a continuation on that theme. Uh, Paul is saying that, that Christ is not divided. And Paul is now talking about the truth of, cro of the cross, which is the message of Christ. And uh, this continues on till uh, the end of the fourth chapter. And the theme overall here is that uh, the church in Corinth is divided. And Paul is strongly uh, correcting them and saying, teaching them why this is wrong. So the, we start off with verse 18. The first one that we're going to look at in detail is, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, the, notice the first word here is the word for. Now, it is the word gar in Greek, uh, which can also be translated because. Now, essentially, if you want to make sense of what because is, we have to go back to the previous verse, right? To understand what, or because of what. So let's, if you uh, go look at the previous verse, uh, which is verse 17, uh, we'll see the background to it. The verse 17 says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So this is uh, the previous verse. And now we'll look at the next verse, which is verse 18, the first one we are looking at. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, brothers and sisters, the connection between both these verses is uh, uh, logos, or the word words. Now, you'll notice there are two uses that are happening in verse 17. It's words of eloquent wisdom, which is... Uh, man's word. Paul is contrasting man's words, which is words of eloquent wisdom in verse 17, with uh, and ref which reflect man's wisdom with God's word, 
which is the word of the cross, as it says in verse 18. And the word, while man's uh, word is eloquent wisdom, Paul says, according to man, the word of the cross is folly. The Greek word is moria. Uh, now, uh, moria is the word or the root word from which we get the word moron in English. It means, it can be translated loosely as a ridiculous thought, something that makes no sense, or something that is foolish. And that is what Paul is saying, man thinks of the cross. Now, what is the word of the cross? Uh, in its fullest sense, it is God's total revelation. It is, uh, it centers around the cross, God's whole redemption story and his whole redemption process uh, seem foolish to unbelievers, right? Christ's work on the cross is the pinnacle of God's word and the pinnacle of God's work. So, and this is what Paul is dry, is trusting on, that one word, that one work. And what is, so when we say the word of the cross in verse 18, he's talking about the entire gospel message. Now, last week, brothers and sisters, if you remember, Brother Neville uh, briefly and very quickly touched on what the word of the cross is uh, by talking about what the work of the cross is. He, so what does it mean when we talk about the cross? What is the work of the cross? And I'm just uh, to remind you, I'm going to go through that one more time. We're not going to spend too long on there. Uh, but consider this, the word of the cross, what it would mean in its fullest sense when you consider uh, uh, pretty much all the context of the New Testament is the first thing that we see the word, or the word of the cross, what it talks about is the righteous judgment of God as seen in Romans 3.25, which tells us how Jesus was the propitiation uh, by his blood, right? And that shows God's righteous judgment where uh, he passed over our sins once the payment was made by Christ. Uh, the word of the cross reveals the burning holiness of God. Uh, Brother Neville referred to Matthew 27, 46, which turns about, talks about how God turned his face away from his son once the sin was placed on him on the cross. Uh, it is the immeasurable love of God, uh, the third one, which talks about Romans 5.8, uh, where God uh, shows his love for us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, the fourth thing we see about the word on the cross is God's remedy for our addiction to sin. Uh, Romans 6.6, 6, how the old self was crucified so that we, could be, we would no longer be enslaved to sin. The fifth thing we see is the way of the cross is the way of the word of the cross is the way of complete victory over the devil. And for that, we see Colossians 2.15, where he says how he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to shame. Verse 6 is the word of the cross is God's answer to the high demands of the law, where again, Colossians 2.14 shows us how the record of debt that stood against us, the legal demands, were nailed to the cross and paid for. And, the third, and lastly, the point seven, it is the solution to every God-made and man-made division. And uh, we looked at Ephesians 2, 15, 16, where uh, by abolish, abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So this is the word of the cross. And this is the powerful thing about the word of the cross. But consider the same thing, this mighty thing, seen from the view of the world. Uh, we saw that Graffito and Rome, the ancient world, the simple understanding of deity, of divine, was, was based on power, how powerful the deity was. And the degree of power determined how high in the ranking or the pyramids of gods would a uh, deity be considered, right? Zeus, the father of gods, one of the most powerful, goes high up, uh, whereas any of the lower ones come lower down in the pyramid. In the Indian system, 
uh, in Hinduism, you have the same ranking of gods, right? But in the cross, the pyramid has been turned upside down. The most powerful God appears to be the most powerless. And so the word of the cross is doing this by appearing foolish, by appearing weak. It's not a sign of power. It's not a sign of wisdom or high class. It's the most humbling, uh, weak thing. And there is another thing that we see in verse 18 that the word of the cross does. It divides. While it breaks down barriers, it also brings judgment in its wake and divides humanity into two groups, brothers and sisters. It's not based on traditional categories of race, class, gender. It's no longer, it's no longer about, say, Greek and Romans versus barbarians, or it's not about Jews versus Gentiles, but it is uh, those who are perishing versus those who are being saved. So all men, as you can see in verse 18, it says that the word of the cross is folly to whom? To those who are perishing. And then who are the other class? To those who are being saved. So what Paul is simply saying is all men are in either the process of being saved, which is salvation uh, present because it's not complete, right? Till the redemption of our body. So that's why there's a present continuous being saved. So all men are either in that category or all men are in the process of being destroyed to those who are perishing because they have rejected the cross. So who, what is the classification based on? It's simply based on one's view of the cross. One's view of the cross determines one's final destiny. And that's what Paul is saying. So let's move on. That's verse 18. So this is Paul's grand statement. This is what uh, he's saying. And now he breaks it down. First thing he does, he starts, he quotes scripture to support this truth. He goes to uh, the next verse, 1 Corinthians 1.19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. So Paul is quoting... Uh, very simply from Isaiah 29, 14. What does Isaiah 29, 14 say? Uh, I'll skip the uh, earlier part of the process, but the key part is the wisdom of the wise man shall perish and the discernment of the discerning man shall be hidden. Uh, and it's while this he's quoted from, uh, and that is a direct connection from, to verse 19, there are multiple portions in scripture, especially in the Old Testament, where this truth is reiterated time and again. Uh, one thing uh, which is very close is uh, Jeremiah 8, 9, where we, say, where we see uh, a similar thing being said, the wise men shall be put to shame, they shall be dismayed and taken. Behold, they have, sorry, behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom is in them? So brothers and sisters, Isaiah's uh, teaching will have its ultimate fulfillment in the last days, right? Uh, but it also had a more immediate uh, thing in context of when it was spoken. When was it spoken? This was spoken when Sennacherib, uh, the king of Assyria, when King Hezekiah was ruling over Judah, uh, King Hezekiah thought everything was very well sorted. They had uh, built up an alliance with Egypt and their wise men and they high uh, administrators and uh, uh, people sat, worked out logic, worked out alliances. And while they were sitting comfortable, here comes Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, uh, and is about to destroy Judah. And this is when God gave the promise to Isaiah to, to, to remind him that uh, they needn't fear Sennacherib's threats because the king's plan would fail. And you can read the detailed account if you go read for 2 Kings 18 and 19. So uh, this is what, right from then, right from the Old Testament, it's very clear that man's wisdom is what God will thwart, God will override, God gives no regard to. Uh, and let's look at the next verse. Paul hammers 
home the point with a series of these rhetorical questions, again, taken from the Old Testament and uh, portions like Isaiah 9, 12, uh, from Isaiah 33, 18. Uh, but in a sense, what uh, is the question is, where is the wise, where is the scribe, where is the debater of this age? Has not God made the foolish the wisdom of the world? Uh, there are these different, three different categories mentioned, wise, scribe, uh, and the debater. And uh, uh, the wise is very simple, Sophia. Uh, scribe is grammatius, a learned person, a person who can write, read and write, who's educated. Uh, the debater, Sizetetis, uh, only used here in the in the Bible, not used anywhere else, uh, which is talking about a person who's a philosopher, who's a respected person who can talk and uh, argue and debate. Uh, and there's much discussion about the nuances of the meanings, but let's come to the real basic truth here. What, what do these three categories of persons have in common? They're all perceived as professional experts, right? person who's a professional wise man, the guy, person who's a scribe and highly educated academician, a person who's a learned speaker, an orator, they're all professional experts. And Paul is saying that no human wisdom can stand before God. That's what, where, where are they? Nowhere. Think about it. It's, and it's so true. It's, this is 2000 years old, but it's so true now. Where are the thinkers, our philosophers, our psychologists, economists, scientists? How much have we evolved? Each year you read how uh, we've developed more in one year than we have developed, say, in 100 years before, 500 years before. Amazing truths, great advancements. Has anything changed in the world? Has suffering eased? Has hunger ended? Has war ended? Has man reached utopia? No. And that is to show the futility of human wisdom. And then Paul asks uh, the last rhetorical question, which leads to the next one, uh, which leads to his explanation, because he says, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? So the whole summary is man's wisdom, man's understanding, man's comprehension, and learning has been brought to nothing by God. How? And that's what we see in the next verse. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, please God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. The English structure seems a little awkward but it is straightforward what Paul is saying. Paul is saying it, is, it was God's wisdom that made the wisdom of man foolish. That's what he's saying. God established it this way. God wisely established it this way. For since in the wisdom of God, it was God's wisdom in, in his wisdom, what did God do? The world did not know God through wisdom. The world did not know God through its worldly wisdom. God wisely established that man could not come to know God by human wisdom. Man cannot solve his problems because he will not recognize the source, which is sin, or the solution, which is salvation. Do you see the wisdom of God in not allowing human wisdom to be the key to knowing God. Apologies if lost if you lost what I was saying. Let me repeat that slowly. Do you see the wisdom of God because of which God chose not to allow human wisdom to be the path, to be the means of knowing God? Because it is through the folly that we are going to, that we're seeing the fo God, God through the folly of what we preach. Uh, so God, what is the folly? The gospel message, the crucified Messiah. So it is through the cross God puts both Jew, Greek, wise, foolish, learned, unlearned, 
on the same level. He's canceled out all human enlightenment on the subject of salvation and redemption. So when it comes to salvation, when it comes to culpability before God, we are all equally liable, all of us equally hopeless, all of us equally without excuse before God. Man's own sinful nature is the cause of his problems and man, even if man recognizes that he's lost, he does not have the power to change it. But it is the folly of God. That's what Paul calls it. God through the folly of what we preach. So what, is the, uh, what does he mean by what we preach? He's not, uh, he's not, he's referring to the content of what, of that proclamation. What is the content of the proclamation? The crucified Messiah. And the folly, that crucified Messiah is, um, is the way out, is salvation, but only not to those who are wise, but only those who will believe, as it says at the end of the verse. God, because it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Who will be believe? Who will be saved? Those who believe. Those who reject man's wisdom, and accept God's foolishness. Those who turn around. So that's uh, Paul is saying. Yes, it's man's wisdom will bring you nowhere. And then we see Paul's explanation again. Uh, for the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. Paul now explaining how this works. Uh, this is almost the second chapter, second section in this whole portion where Paul explains how God out overpowers the smart, the strong, and outsmarts uh, the wise. The Jews and the Greeks here illustrate the basic idolatries of humanity. They're not so much specific to the race but you could even apply it generically broadly. One is those who seek signs. One are those who seek rational explanation. You could say uh, the people who are looking for uh, experiences in the present world, who are seeking God saying, if God exists, why doesn't he uh, show himself or strike lightning or those who are looking for signs? I'm sure you have some friends who might have told you that. If God is this, why doesn't he show himself? The second one are the rationalists who say science disproves God. If, uh, if God is true, there has to be some scientific basis, right? So these idolatries are there from right from the start, brothers and sisters. They are the idolatries of the fallen world. So, and the gospels record, if you, uh, if you look at these two, the Jews demand signs. The gospels record how Jews repeatedly requested signs from Jesus to prove that he's from God, yet when miracles were performed, they either blamed it on the devil or chose not to believe him. Uh, desire for proof most frequently is actually evasion, an excuse for not believing. What about the Greeks? Uh, there were plenty of them in Corinth and uh, the concept is, is all the more true in our present world, which believes, who says we only believe in science, right? Uh, they exalted, the Greeks exalted uh, st uh, their standards of pagan philosophies and poets. Uh, ancient Greece is well known for all uh, the influential philosophers. I mean, Western philosophy is based on them. Socrates, Plato, uh, uh, Aristotle, all the, the bedrock of Western philosophy is Greek philosophy, right? Uh, and so much so, even back then, the, the Greeks were turning from gods to their Sophia, their Philosophia because that was what they said was the most in fashion then. So this is what, this is what the Jews are looking for signs, the Greeks are looking for uh, elevated power, for status, for wisdom. And what does God offer? God offers, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. To the seekers of signs and wisdom, Paul now provides the ultimate divine contradiction, brothers and sisters. Rather than giving them signs and wisdom, God has plenty of both if he chooses, but he, he gives them weakness and folly. Okay, very quickly, uh, we seem to be doing okay for time. From a Jew's point of view, you can have a Messiah 
or you can have a crucifixion. You can't have both. Because Messiah meant what? Messiah meant power, splendor, triumph. Uh, it, and what does crucifixion stand for? Weakness, humiliation, defeat. To the Jew, the message of a crucified Messiah was the ultimate scandal. Don't, we remember, right? Deuteronomy. Hanging is the fulfillment of the law of punishment, of humiliation, of shame. There is no way that Christ crucified can be fitted rationally into their understanding of God or scripture. And that is why Christ crucified is a stumbling block to the Jew seeking a sign. About, what about uh, Gentiles of folly? It is difficult, uh, brothers and sisters, for us to, uh, to appreciate uh, the word folly here is not, though uses the same word I was reading in some places where how it is much more powerful here. It is more than just foolishness. It is utter madness, as uh, some of the scholars say. It is difficult for us to appreciate how ridiculous it seemed the message of God could be if he got crucified by his enemy, enemies on a cross, on the most uh, degrading form of punishment the Romans could think of. So it was a ridiculous religion. And that is why, if you remember in the Roman uh, graffito that we saw in the beginning, so it was a ridiculous religion that proclaimed salvation through the death of a man. How can a person who couldn't save themselves save you? So who, how could a person who's a common, uh, despised racial person, a Jew, who are under rule by Romans, claim divineness and say, I will save you? So it was insanity. And that is what we are seeing. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. Do you see what God did? God took man's understanding, man's expectation, and just turned it on its head. And we come to the next verse. But to those who are called, so we've, we've seen how the cross is folly to those who are perishing, is the power of God. Then we see how God has already decreed it in the past to his prophets. Uh, he's challenged the wise men, he's challenged the scribes, he's challenged the debaters. And then we see how God chose in his wisdom not to allow man's wisdom to find him. And then we saw what man in his fallen state is looking for. He's looking for signs, he's looking for uh, uh, wisdom. But God gave them the cross. But what is the cross? which is a stumbling block for the Jews, is a foolishness to the, the rest of the world. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul makes clear that he's been using the term Jews and Greeks in a general way to represent unbelieving in the broadest sense people. Because it, it can include both those, it could include everyone. But irrespective of who you are or who they are that Paul is talking about, but to those who are called, this Christ is himself. It's no longer something. Christ is the embodiment of the very power of God. He's the embodiment of the very wisdom of God. He who is the stumbling block to the unbelieving Jew is the savior to the believer. He who is the foolishness to the unbelieving Gentile is the Redeemer, the all-wise God to those who believed him. We sang that just before here, the wisdom of God. We praise it, we exalt it, but to the world it seems as utter foolishness. And Paul ends with this conclusion, uh, verse 25, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Paul now brings closure to his argument by summarizing. God is both wiser and stronger than human beings. 
but Paul keeps his structure, the contra, uh, this paradoxical sentence structure and continues it here. He says that to the perishing uh, world, the cross is a folly, yes, but it is God's folly. And because it is God's, even folly from God is better than the wisdom of man. And the same thing uh, to, the wise, to the wise man, uh, the cross seems, uh, or those seeking signs, it seems the cross is the weakness of God because God became weak, became uh, by crucifixion. But in the crucifixion, God proved stronger than any man by overpowering sin, by overpowering death, by giving us freedom, by making us free once again, by bringing us back into his family. So that was the ultimate demonstration of power, divine power, the power of resurrection. And that is where God turned the tables on human and humanity. In a few minutes, very briefly, brothers and sisters, I want to go back I want to consider when I was looking at the whole thing, it's an amazing, in this beautiful portion, you see the key, right? It, we are the world. Before we came to know God, this was true about each and every one of us. The word of the cross was folly. Uh, it was a sign of weakness. It was a sign of foolishness. It did not make sense. As the rest of the world, the most learned people in the world right now mock and laugh at people who still preach or believe in the cross, right? So what changed? Because God, you and I weren't smart. You and I weren't smart enough to save ourselves. That's very clear. Because verse 21 says, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God would not allow that. So what happened? Verse 24 is the key. How did people who had no hope of knowing God come to know? those who are called. We've spoken before about this, or at least I recall speaking about this, uh, and I want to talk about this briefly, because very simply, it's very relevant when you come to the next portion, verse 26, starts talking, asks us, the audience, to consider our calling. What is this calling? Who called? It's God's call. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So how does God call? What is What kind of a call is it? We know the scripture has two kinds of call. But in the New Testament, it's always about this call, which is God's call, which is the other term theologians use is the effectual call. And what is the nature of this effectual call? Uh, for, uh, uh, before we even look at that, it's something Paul already introduced in verse 9 of the same chapter been talking to the to his audience right where he reminds them in his thanksgiving that god is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son jesus christ our lord you were called you were called by god what was that call brothers and sisters that is the gospel more than the gospel call to this he called you through our gospel the gospel call is the general call it goes to everyone, right? It is when you preach the word of God, when you share the gospel with a friend, when we distribute tracts, uh, whether you go on open air, when you have gospel meetings or outreach events, that is the, out, the general call. But then there is another one, the God's call, the effectual call. Why is it called the effectual call? Because it creates what it commands. It has, it is effect, it is effective. It's, it's not, it's more than someone calling you saying, hey, can you come or invitation to join you? Uh, you can choose to either accept or refuse. Imagine a, a call that you don't have an option to refuse. That is God's call. And that is how you can differentiate between the types of calls. And that is the kind of, just look at this uh, portion we just looked at, verses 22 to 24 again. Uh, let's read this one more time. For the Jews demand signs, the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. 
but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. What's happening here? Paul is preaching the gospel. He's preaching Christ crucified, the story of Jesus dying, paying for our sins, uh, the salvation open to everyone who will receive, who is willing to accept Christ as the Savior. What is the response? Most uh, will uh, stumble because the gospel is unacceptable. Some will say it's foolish. Some will uh, say this is not wise. Some will say this is a weakness. They are not saved. But then some say this is truly the power of God and come into salvation. What makes the difference? The difference is verse 24, those who are called. So the call of God is, is a powerful call. It's a call that changes. It's a call that does what it's God wants it to do. And what does that call do? We've seen that again at some other time, many times, Romans 8.30. In the golden chain, in the order of salutes, we see that if those who are called are the ones God predestined. But, and those whom he called, he justified justification you are how are you justified we are justified by faith alone therefore we have justified by faith right so what is this was saying that whom he called he justified that is telling you the truth brothers and sisters about the power of god's calling what it is saying is that God is able to even make, create something that didn't exist. The gospel comes with a charge, with the ability to even create faith in us, right? The, the command of God can create what has been called. And we see that very clearly in Romans 4, 17, the latter half which I've highlighted who gives life to the dead and calls into the calls into existence the things that do not exist. Do you remember our precious faith that Peter talks about in, uh, in the opening of 2 Peter? He thanks God and he reminds that we have received this precious faith. Where did it come from? From God. So the faith that you exercise is the faith that God gave. It is an what has the reason for that is the call. So that is the amazing truth of this uh, gospel call. Uh, what we looked at, what was the statement? For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You are saved. You can see this power of God because God called you, God chose you. And that is the truth. Uh, that we need to be constantly in light of. Let us live in the light of that truth. You see the wisdom all around you. You see the world around you. Uh, don't be perplexed at why the biggest, uh, most erudite people might seem to be hopelessly lost because God called you. And therefore, we who are of no regard to the world know and who are being saved know the true power of God. And we give glory and honor and worship him. May God bless his word. Thank you. Thank you, brother.